second day. I hope that you find today to be as interesting and as exciting as yesterday. Um, unfortunately, you're going to have to begin by listening to me. Um, so, I plan today to do a brief overview of the technology for measuring poverty that was developed by Dana, John Geyer, and myself. It has to be brief. I'm limited to 15 minutes, so forgive me. Why do we want to measure poverty multidimensionally? First reason, don't you think that income is just not enough for describing poverty? That consumption is not everything in life? There are other dimensions that are missing when you simply look at income. Our approach was developed to complement the income-based approach or even to incorporate it. Secondly, there's a theoretical framework which allows us to think about multidimensional poverty. This theoretical framework is Amartya Sen's capability approach. It, by definition, is multidimensional because there are many capabilities. We also have many more data sources than we had even a few years ago. So it becomes now possible to imagine constructing multidimensional poverty. <coughs> and there are new tools building upon the unidimensional approach that are now available. These have been developed pretty recently and have taken unidimensional ideas and constructed multidimensional ideas. Finally, and most importantly, all the rest of the reasons I've given are nothing compared to this reason. There's demand for this type of measurement, and the demand is coming from governments and other organizations. The demand arises because with a multidimensional poverty index, people can see the effect of good policies on poverty. And therefore, it rewards good performance by governments. These feedback circles are what create good governance. Secondly, this approach can be used to coordinate different parts of an organization or government. <coughs> that coordination problem is the essence of development economics. It's what underlies many problems in the developing world, and I should add, developed world as well. If you can coordinate ministries better to achieve the outcome, decreasing poverty in a comprehensive way, then this is an incredible outcome that can be extremely important. So I give this question to you. Suppose that you wanted to create a multidimensional poverty measure. Think how you might do it. And I put before you some desiderata. Desiderata mean things that you would want this measure to achieve or to be. I put as number one. It had better be understandable and easy to describe. Otherwise, when you explain it to your president, to ministers, to the people, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. It should conform to a common sense notion of poverty, not something abstruse. It must fit the purpose that you need the poverty measure or the evaluation measure for. It should be technically solid, which means typically it's published somewhere, right? <laughs> it must be operationally viable which means you can actually use it with the data you have. And then finally, you have to be able to use it again. It should be replicable. What would you advise? That's the question that's on the table from this conference. So let me just tell you the answer that we provided. It's just one answer. Our proposal started with the notion 
of identification of the poor. Who are poor? In terms of two cutoffs. Deprivation cutoffs, where in each dimension in which you could be deprived, there is a cutoff saying you're deprived or not. And once you've identified the deprivations, you identify the poor by who is multiply deprived, who has many deprivations. How many? That's the poverty cutoff. If you have this many or more, you are considered to be poor. So that's the identification of this poverty measure approach. The aggregation is simply an adjusted FGD index, Paul Stricker and Thorbeck. And it reduces entirely to the single dimension FGT measure when you just have one dimension of well-being. So this is a pure generalization of what's used at the World Bank and all the poverty papers, etc. The background papers are given here with Sabina, a number of papers. Uh, you can get them online. The concept behind this is Poverty is multiple deprivations. This follows what BRAC uses, both in Bangladesh, in Africa, and many NGOs use this idea of counting deprivations or analyzing in many dimensions through breadth. Secondly, it depends on the joint distribution, a very important point. Some people want to do it dimension by dimension separate from one another. That loses tremendous information as to who is multiply deprived. We need the joint distribution to discern where the priorities lie, where we should go, who we should help first. The approach also is understanding of the limitations of data. Many types of data are ordinal. If you're describing sanitation, like Amar Sen was talking a little yesterday, how do you describe sanitation as one, two, three, four, five? It's a category or a description. As long, how, uh, however, as long as you can say that these are deprived and these are not, the method works. Ordinal data work perfectly well. Even part, uh, categorical data work well. And the idea is that we convert the qualitative data into quantitative data through the dichotomization. Yes, no. It's transparent because once you have decided on all of its pieces, anyone can replicate the result with the same data set. You just need to specify the variables, the cutoffs, and the values for each of the deprivations. You can also check to make sure it's robust, and that's one of the important points in this, that the government can report it and then give the data, and many eyes can check if it's in fact the case when we change a little bit here and there. So there can be public discussion about policy very easily through this methodology. And it can be implemented at many levels, across the country in the MPI, the UN's Human Development Report since 2010, within countries as, we, as we've just seen and will be seeing shortly. Also the discussion of states in uh, Brazil. Even at the local village level, it's been implemented in a participatory way. And it can be used for evaluation of social programs. My colleague Stephen Smith, the author of the best-selling development economics text with Todaro, uh, has been implementing it with a student of his. As I said, it's a coordination tool, and it can be used to construct all manner of other indices and has been used. The Gross National Happiness is built on this framework. The Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index is built on this framework. There are service delivery indices built on this framework by a student of mine. And there's corruption indices in the World Bank Economic Review that are analogous to this framework. So, let's jump right in. Here's a matrix. It's a brief description of a part of a data set in order to illustrate <coughs> this approach. 
notice I said equally important domains are not going to have different values, like with Mexico, 50% income, and then each of the social indices has smaller than that. I'm, not I'm just going to say equal for all four for the purposes of illustration. You can change that then. Each domain is like, say the first one is income per day received by a household, or the next one or a person. Uh, the second one is uh, education level. So 14 years of education is pretty good. The third one is self-reported health. Five being best, one being poor health. And the final one being access to a service or not. So here are the four domains. I've listed the data for four persons. Our main question is who's poor and how much poverty there is. First, let's identify who is deprived and when are they deprived. We use the cutoff vector below. That's the first type of cutoff, deprivation cutoff. I say $13 a day is the cutoff for income. That's not that far from U.S. poverty requirements. 12 years of education, again U.S., so I'm concentrating on that example. Uh, you have to have a high school education or you're considered deprived. <coughs> the lowest two levels of poor and fair health in this example are considered deprived. And finally, if you don't have access to social service, the only thing below one is zero, you're considered deprived. So who's deprived and when? The underlying entries in the matrix describe when a person is deprived. But who is poor? We have someone with all four deprivations, another one with two deprivations, another one with one deprivation. Who's poor? We use a deprivation matrix to summarize this data in a simplified form. One if you're deprived, oops, one if you're deprived, and zero if you're not deprived. Okay? Who is poor is accomplished with the second cutoff, analogous to a poverty line with income. Of course, a poverty line with income is arbitrary in many ways. You may give a justification, but that justification is not perfect. Similarly, here, <coughs> you choose a cutoff. If the cutoff were small, it would be at one extreme. If it were large, it would be another extreme. Instead, we choose something in between. Example here is page two. That knocks out the final person with one deprivation. Leaves the two middle persons, and of course, the person with no deprivation was never considered as an option to begin with. This intermediate approach allows us to evaluate poverty even when there are many, many deprivations, dimensions. So it's very practical, allows intermediate identification of who's poor. But also we can change the K to evaluate robustness. So we've identified who's poor. How much poverty is there? That's the final stage of measuring poverty. So we get rid of the last person. That person's not poor. We replace the deprivation with zero because we're not focusing on the non-poor in our exercise of measuring poverty. The censored, de uh, the censored deprivation matrix is given here. It depends on K because if you had a different K, the persons who would be poor would be different, and so you may knock out or include different people. So I say G0 of K. Now, I've counted on the right-hand side the numbers of deprivations that are in this deprivation matrix, the sensor deprivation matrix. I have zero for the first and last who are not poor. And for the middle two, I have two and four. Hmm. Let's ignore the two and four for the moment. We have two people who are poor. That means we have 50% of the population who's poor. The headcount ratio. 
Is that a good measure of poverty? Well, maybe not. Because if someone has another deprivation, someone who's poor, it doesn't matter. For the headcount ratio, it ignores this breadth of poverty. So maybe to make things better, we should augment the information beyond the headcount ratio. This slide gives that augmentation. So let me take you through this slide. We have the censored deprivation matrix. We have the censored count to the right side. And then I have this share of deprivations that a person experiences. That's two out of four, or four out of four, on the right-hand side. That's the information that I would like to use to augment information on the percentage of the population who is poor. So if I take the average of the two-fourths and the four-fourths, I get three-fourths. That's the average intensity or breadth of poverty among the poor. Okay? If I take that average intensity and multiply H by that, I now take into account both the incidence of poverty and the intensity multiplied together. That's the adjusted headcount ratio behind all the measures that we have been talking about. H times A here is a half times three-fourths, which would be three-eighths. But there's an easier way to calculate it. Look at the matrix. Count up all the entries, 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0 plus 1. Add all those up. You get 6, don't you? Now, divide by the number of entries. There should be 16. 6 over 16. Hmm. That's also 3 eighths. The second way of com computing is very easy. Take the mean of the matrix, the average of the entries in the matrix. That's M0. Notice that if one of the zeros for a person were to become a 1, poverty would rise because intensity would go up. Final slide. Well, almost. <laughs> this uses ordinal data. Let me say that again. It's friendly to bad data. Secondly, it's very similar to an existing measure of income poverty. The per capita poverty gap measures the depth of poverty for people, how far below the poverty line they are. Analogously, we're measuring the breadth of poverty with our multidimensional approach. Our measure is decomposable by people, north, south, ethnic group, any cut of the population allows us to find poverty within the cut and then aggregate consistently back so that policies that you focus on the south and on the north, if they succeed, they'll succeed for the country overall. It's also, most importantly, decomposable across dimensions after the identification has been done. That means you can take the percentage of people who are both poor and deprived in the first dimension, the percentage of people that are poor and deprived in the second dimension, third and fourth, these are called censored TED count ratios, and average them up to get the adjusted head count ratio. The HJ are the censored head count ratios. So you can identify what type of poverty this is. Is it a poverty of income, of education? What's the source? And what do we need to do to address this type of poverty? And of course, everything extends to the case very easily where you have different values for each of the deprivations. So we saw these desiderata before. Think whether it has understandability. It has a common sense notion of poverty. It may fit the purpose for some purposes, right? It seems technically solid. You can use it and maybe use it again, huh?
What do you think? Thank you. That's it. What I am going to do is, in a sense, building on James's presentation, um, simply to show the same things in pictures. I'm a transition between what James Foster did in explaining the methodology to you and what my colleagues Jose Manuel Roche and Schumann Set will do um, after this session in explaining the global MPI and its analysis. And the point that I would like to convey is that if you are thinking either about a national measure or about a global MPI 2.0 and how it can fit into the um, other indicators that are part of the uh, Millennium Development Goal post-2015 initiative, then in a sense we want to have very clear the capabilities of analysis and description that the method um, can be used for after it is computed. And James already went through those um, by speaking of the censored head counts and the properties of decomposability and subgroup consistency. But here I would like to link it to the post-2015 discussion very briefly. In the high-level panel report released last week, they called for a data revolution because data for 40% of the countries are not available on child malnutrition before and after the year 2000. Our data on income poverty are old um, and we do not have the frequency of data that is required to monitor our advance in the Millennium Development Goals. Um, Obajit Sen yesterday reminded us of one of the uses, as did others, of an MPI in going beyond government silos and urging co coordination across ministries. In the post-2015 MDG discussions, inequality has become central, not looking at a national aggregate of poverty, but breaking it down by region or by ethnic group uh, to see where people are poor and how policies can reflect inequalities. And finally, there is a need in the high-level panel which was stressed very much, which has come up here in discussions of indigenous groups and in others, of the need to look at the poorest of the poor. And for us, that is something that is missing at the moment from the measurement tools of the Millennium Development Goal system, which is a measure like uh, uh, this measure, which looks at the overlapping de deprivations people face, and so looks at the multiply disadvantaged, which you cannot do from a dashboard of the current Millennium Development Goals. But we are not arguing that the measure that Jose and Schumann will present should be the right measure. That measure, as they will say, is very constrained by data. And so what we are asking you to imagine is if you were designing an international survey, whether for your country or internationally, what indicators would you put in? What are your dimensions of poverty? And perhaps instead of using one set of deprivation cutoffs, we could use two one that is appropriate in situations of acute poverty, and one for countries that are more developed. Schumann Set will show one slide on the usefulness, and James had a conference on ultra-poverty. And also, we can look at different intensities of poverty. And so, I'm asking you to imagine a measure that does not exist, but that might give us information that would be policy relevant after 2015. And I'll do that very quickly. Um, what we are looking at is the same indicators for one person. And that is missing from the dashboard of the Millennium Development Goals. We know if 30% of children are undernourished. We know how many children are out of school or how many um, families do not have access to sanitation. But we do not know at the present moment with the MDG indicators which families experience all of these deprivations at the same time. And the distinctive value added, affirmed both by our academic colleagues and by the, the policy audience of an MPI, is to be able to look at one person, one life, one household, and the, experience, the profile of deprivations that they experience. 
Another value of MPI is that for the indicators it contains, which will not be all of the post-2015 indicators, but some that are available from a survey and that are relevant widely, that have some global consensus, is that it can give a headline. In an article James and I did um, with uh, our co-author Maria Masantos, we observed that with a lot of dashboards, then the headline in the newspaper will always be poverty has gone up and gone down and remained unchanged. Because among a large dashboard of indicators, it's very difficult to summarize. And in a sense, an MPI gives a summary figure like this for Nepal to show changes over time. And then that intuition of how poverty has changed can be unpacked. It can be unpacked by geographic regions, as James said, to look at disparity within countries. This is among the 13 regions of Nepal, or by caste, or by ethnicity, to look at the inequalities uh, among those groups. It can be decomposed. These are the changes in censored headcounts, James mentioned, by indicator, to see how poverty went down. And that can be useful, as the countries yesterday showed, as a monitoring tool. Then that national aggregate of how poverty changed can be broken apart again into the different regions. Again, these are the regions of Nepal. And this is useful again, um, as uh, our many presentations yesterday showed, to look uh, subnationally at what policies are working where, and also what the needs are in different uh, geographic and um, climactic conditions. So our proposal for an MPI 2.0 is that it have two levels. Like a national poverty indicator in the income sense, the countries develop national MPIs as we are trying to do in the network that we are launching because only these will truly reflect the political priorities, the data um, specificities, and the voices of the poor and of experts in countries. But that perhaps alongside this, um, as a sister measure to the $1.25 a day headcount and the $2 a day and the $10 a day income poverty measures, there would be an international MPI that would um, uh, look across them. And that international MPI could do what Jose and Schumann will show we are trying to do with the existing one. Some comparisons across countries and with other measures, this with income. Some comparisons of how quickly countries have changed um, on the core set of indicators which are being compared. And so, um, in a sense, that is when we speak of an MPI 2.0. 2.0 because when a new version of Windows or a new version of some, something else comes out, it's, it's the next level up. So it's an innovation on what already exists, an improvement, something that has the reflection of more eyes and more minds in it. That that is what would be useful. We are not saying that is the only application of the methodology that James explained. It can also be used for happiness, as in the case of Bhutan, for a well-being measure for women's empowerment, as Ana Vaj and I have done, um, and for child poverty, as Jose Manuel Roche has done in Bangladesh. Um, so in a sense, this is our proposal um, of how the methodology that James explained can be used. It shows the overlapping deprivations at the household level, which the individual MDGs do not do. And then it can look at changes over time, breaking it down, um, being tailored to national contexts for national MPIs, and perhaps having an international measure that would be useful across countries. Um, and that that, in a sense, the MPI 2.0 could only be used alongside a data revolution, in which we have some surveys that it have indicators of work, or of violence, or of empowerment, or whatever is agreed upon as the global goods in the forthcoming season. Thank you.